Hey guys, what's up? It's Kelly again, and welcome back to my channel. Between living in a few different foreign countries, traveling to so many more as a tourist, and having a YouTube channel focused entirely on cultural differences, I've grown to become quite accustomed to hearing all of the well-known talking points about American culture. Most non-Americans are aware of our love for the American flag, our supersized meals, our comparatively loose gun control laws, and just how loud we can be. But there are a lot of other very, very American cultural practices, traditions, and social norms that if you're a foreigner, you probably have never really heard of, which is what today's video is all about. So without further ado, let's talk about the nine most American things you've never heard of. The first thing I'll talk about are our honor flights. Now, it's no secret that the U.S. has a culture that's very supportive of its military and veterans, but did you know that there's an entire network of nonprofit organizations dedicated to flying veterans from wherever they live in the United States to here, Washington, D.C., so that they can see the memorials dedicated to them? Until 2004, there was not a World War II memorial in Washington, D.C., and by the time of its dedication, many American World War II veterans had unfortunately already passed, or they did not have the resources to be able to travel to Washington, D.C. to visit this truly impressive memorial. And so these nonprofits took on the task and began these honor flights in 2005. In just 15 years, they've flown over a quarter million veterans to D.C. for this purpose, and all at no cost to the veteran. While initially the focus was getting World War II veterans to D.C., the Honor Flight Network has expanded their mission to include veterans of the Vietnam, Korean, and Gulf Wars as well, and they not only see the memorials on the National Mall, but also Arlington Cemetery, which is our largest and most famous military cemetery located just across the Potomac River from D.C. in Arlington, Virginia. Sometimes when the veterans arrive to D.C., a welcoming ceremony is held for them where volunteers from the community will wait outside their arrival gate and clap and cheer for them as they walk into the airport. Or perhaps their representative of Congress or state senator greets them at the memorials and thanks them for their service. And this is all part of giving these veterans a hero's welcome during their honor flight experience. Feels pretty American, right? The next fairly unknown but massively popular American custom is tailgating. A tailgate party is essentially a social gathering hosted on or around the open trunk or tailgate of a vehicle. These parties are typically held before a sporting event or perhaps even a concert and are located in the parking lot or neighboring fields outside of the venue. Tailgating is most popular for college football and at universities with bigger football teams like the University of South Carolina or Pennsylvania State University, which is where I went to school, it can take up acres and acres of land around the stadium every weekend there's a game. For many people, tailgating is actually the highlight of going to a football game, to the point where a lot of people don't even actually go into the game, but they still come to tailgate. The two most critical ingredients for a tailgate party are the food and the alcohol. It's basically one massive barbecue party or grill party where people are grilling everything from cheap chicken to extremely pricey steaks and ribs. I've even seen entire cooking shows focused on recipes for tailgates, and people who regularly tailgate truly have this down to a science. And as for the alcohol, this is one of the few exceptions we have to our laws forbidding drinking in public. People bring huge loads of alcohol, predominantly beer and sometimes even entire kegs, and they are more than able to stand in the parking lot and legally drink that beer in public. There are also all sorts of games people play at tailgates, but these aren't your usual drinking games like beer pong or flip cup, but rather more lawn games like can jam, ladder golf, stump, dizzy bat, and my personal favorite, cornhole, or as some call it, bags. 
Some people will have a very simple setup and then others will invest a lot of money into their tailgate and have these incredibly elaborate setups complete with satellite dishes and TVs or even entire RV campers. And at college football tailgates, you will also likely come across some ensembles from the university band as they weave their way through tailgates and stop every once in a while to play for tailgaters. Or maybe you'll see some of the team's cheerleaders posted up to take photos with fans. And this is all part of the tailgate experience and getting the fans really excited for the game and to watch their team win. You've probably have heard about our American small talk custom, but have you heard of the Jeep Wave? Jeep is a brand of American manufactured automobiles, which really made its mark by producing four-wheel reconnaissance vehicles named Jeeps for the American military during World War II. There are countless photos and videos of generals like Dwight D. Eisenhower and Patton riding in their Jeeps during the war throughout the battlefields. Supposedly, the Jeep wave started either during or right after World War II when soldiers would pass each other in their military jeeps and give each other a little wave as a sort of sign of camaraderie. Another theory is that it didn't start until the 70s when non-military jeeps started to become really popular with the American public. It's a thing that a lot of jeep owners are very proud of, but in my opinion, it's nothing that Jeep owners have really cornered the market on. In small towns and rural areas across the United States, people tend to give a quick wave at each other while passing by on slower roads, regardless of the vehicle they're driving. It's funny because when I'm driving in DC, I feel no urge to wave at any other driver or person that I'm passing, but as soon as I leave the metropolitan area and I get into the more rural areas of Virginia and Maryland, or even Pennsylvania, which is where I'm from, it's like my hand just starts compulsively coming off the steering wheel and waving at drivers or people walking on the side of the road in these slower back roads. And I think it's just another custom symbolizing American friendliness. And the next American thing you've never heard of is our dear friend, our symbol of true idiocy, our beloved Florida man. About 10 years ago, the internet began to recognize a very distinctive trend in the news headlines where it seemed that the most unusual crimes or events ranging from just strange to absolutely insane occur in Florida. These headlines will often include the description Florida man. And so the Florida man meme and the new favorite target for internet jokes was born. Touted as the world's worst superhero, the Florida man has proven that our nation can in fact unite over at least one thing, that a lot of people who live in Florida make really bad decisions. The next topic are our fire stations or fire halls. And I mean, sure, you probably know that we have fire stations, but we use them for way more than just housing firefighting equipment, vehicles, and personnel. In small towns and cities across the United States, fire halls serve as sort of a linchpin of social activity for that community. Fire halls are used to host a number of different social events and even weddings. Yes, some Americans will get married at the local fire hall or they'll at least hold their reception there. And one of the regular and dare I say famous reoccurring social events that fire departments across the United States will hold is bingo night. Bingo night serves as a bit of fun for the local citizens and it also helps that fire department raise money for its fire station. Another very American thing that you probably never heard of is women's winter. Compared to our European counterparts and pretty much every other country in the world, Americans use a lot of air conditioning. Now there are entire regions in 
in the U.S., like the Pacific Northwest, the Heartland, some parts of the New England states where the houses don't come with air conditioning as a default feature because the temperatures don't get hot enough to warrant that. However, the majority of the U.S. is very dependent on air conditioning, especially in office buildings. Now, in these office buildings, the temperature settings are controlled for the entire building or perhaps the entire floor or maybe a very, very large office space. And so each individual person working in that office sort of has to deal with that blanket temperature setting that has been decided for them. In the summer, when everyone starts cranking up that AC, the temperature of the offices are often set a few degrees cooler than what women would prefer in order to accommodate men because they run a little hotter than women. They are usually wearing suits with the long shirts and the jackets and ties and there might be a little bit of sexism involved as well. Whereas women in the summer are often wearing lighter weight clothing, dresses, skirts, lighter tops because of how warm it is outside. And so with the temperature being set so much cooler, it's common for you to walk into an office building and see women at their desks wearing sweaters, shawls, entire blankets in order to try to keep themselves warm. I've even have personally had and have seen other women have personal heaters at their desks to, again, try to keep themselves warm. And this phenomena of sorts is called women's winter because it's not winter, it's the summer, but it's it's like it's winter inside of the building because it's air conditioned so much and it's only women who are affected by it. So it's, so it's like a second winter for women, women's winter. Let's move on. Another American thing that you probably have never heard of are our dry counties. Now sure, you probably know that the US's alcohol laws are quite a bit more strict than many other countries, given that our minimum drinking age is 21 and that public drinking is forbidden in most of the United States. But did you know that there are still entire counties that are living the life of prohibition? Right, right now, in, in 2020. In 1933, the 21st Amendment was ratified, which repealed the 18th Amendment, which was the amendment that mandated a nationwide prohibition. But what the 21st Amendment also did was allow local and state governments to decide whether they wanted to maintain prohibition. And some of them did. The reason why these counties have decided to maintain a prohibition on alcohol within their jurisdiction is usually religious. And so these counties are typically found within a region of the United States we call the Bible Belt. The Bible Belt is most of the South, where there's a strong relationship between religion and society and politics. The next topic is Teach for America. Teach for America is a nonprofit organization that recruits college graduates to teach in low-income communities for at least two years. These schools are often located in urban areas like New York City or Chicago or very rural areas. These college graduates don't necessarily have to have a teaching degree or even a teaching certificate because they'll receive an alternative certificate through the Teach for America program. And the intent of Teach for America is to help schools that struggle to recruit certified teachers to work because they can't offer competitive salaries and teachers experience an increased hardship working there compared to other schools in the U.S. Pumpkin patches are another super American thing that you might not have heard about. Sure, maybe you know that a lot of our food products morph into a pumpkin spiced version of themselves as soon as fall hits, but our obsession with pumpkin goes far beyond the walls of our grocery stores and Starbucks. Farms across the United States will adapt at least a portion of their property into a pumpkin patch or some sort of fall harvest themed park, offering games, hay rides, and other activities for families to be able to take their kids to enjoy, or really lonely 20-something year olds. 
And some farms will convert entire cornfields into these massive corn mazes, some of which can be quite intricate. And a lot of families like to go and try to solve this giant puzzle of a maze, and it's my personal nightmare, but a lot of people seem to really enjoy it. All right, guys. That's it. Those are the nine super American things that you probably have never heard of. I have looked at so many lists on the internet listing out all of these different aspects of American culture and I've never seen any of these make those lists and I don't really know why because I mean I think these are really American. So I hope that you enjoyed this video and if you did don't forget to give it a big thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed to my channel yet, first of all, why not? Really though, why not? Go ahead and hit that subscribe button and click the bell so you get notified every single time I post a new video. Thank you so much to all of my patrons for the support you've given me and I will see you guys next time. Bye.